nine minutes. <laughs> Is that you're making up for me? I'm making it up. <laughs> <laughs> to you. Um, Look, I find it highly ironic that I'm probably the only dub in the house. I don't know about the guys working there, but certainly I feel like saying there are any dubs in the house at all. Because it's always made look like that there's an urban-rural divide, and that's what's at the back of this. Uh, but I do have to comment that most of the rural TDs are from Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, and it's extraordinarily ironic that they come here time after time, making a commitment to rural Ireland, and at every hand's turn, they are destroying, with their policies, uh, the very existence of rural Ireland. And I want to argue that it isn't, uh, that there's some deep uh, fissure between people born in Dublin or the greater Dublin area and the rest of the country. Indeed, most of people in the Dublin area would have country cousins. Uh, and and it, that it's not sort of an antagonism towards rural Ireland, but rather it's an issue of politics and class. And uh, just like you have, and I'll go through the stats later on, very isolated parts of rural Ireland where people suffer deep poverty, unemployment and tick all the boxes. You also have that in areas like Neilstown, like Jobstown and indeed parts of my constituency like Ballyfermot. So the question of class is very fundamental to this and how resources are used is very fundamental. But most importantly, it's what political policies are driving the destruction and the isolation of rural Ireland. And they are the policies of modern day neoliberalism that everything that happens happens has to happen to turn over a book to make a profit despite the occupancy of the areas the quality of life and the people who live within them so I'm going to you look at three examples um, I couldn't repeat uh, only to completely agree with Martin Ferris I couldn't uh, repeat as eloquently as he did the tragedy of what's happened to rural fishing communities it's absolutely tragic, and I often think when I see the Wild Atlantic Way advertised, because I know the West of Ireland extremely well, I love it, um, I often think they're advertising something that they have pulled apart and destroyed. There used to be dozens of little piers around Mayo, Galway, Donegal, Kerry, that one could drive along, visit, camp aside, hang out in, rent a house nearby, and the life has been torn out of them. You'll hardly ever see a crab cage or a, 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 a bunch of nets uh, because the life has been torn out of those rural communities, and as a consequence, the people have left. But let me look at three specific issues that I've been involved in dealing with since I came in here. One bus errand, rural transport, is being treated again like a commodity if it doesn't turn over profit, and if it doesn't turn over those profits quick enough and fast enough to compete on the open market with the private operators, then what's the answer? Drive down the wages and conditions of the workers that are, are in the company, and indeed take away many of the rural transport routes. Something like 200 uh, towns and cities, towns mainly, have been left uh, without bus air and services. And at the end of this month, we are about to close down the uh, bus line that services Dublin to Derry. I know that it's going to be passed on to the Translink Company in Northern Ireland, but at the same time, we are going to bypass lots of towns that that bus route now serves. And we've, been, we've seen the strike, we've been through the arguments about this, but the National Transport Authority, a quango set up by the Department of Transport, which allows Shane Ross to sit there through months of the transport strike, and probably again will in the future when they uh, try to uh, bully workers into accepting deals with the, with the threat that this company will fold if you don't accept them allows Shane Ross to say, nothing to do with me, it's all the National Transport Authority who are issuing the licences, nothing to do with me, it's a dispute between them and the unions. And I think that that neoliberal, hands-off approach to a very fundamental service in rural Ireland has led to a lot, a lot of its isolation. The second remarkable thing I'd like to talk about is the closure of the post offices and the demise of what those post offices mean to rural Ireland and to villages. All of us know, anecdotally, and I certainly have never lived long enough in rural Ireland, but anecdotally I could tell you of how I have seen at first hand the post office act as a social headquarters for local villages and communities, and how the postmaster or the postmistress was almost like a social worker, knowing exactly who, what, when, how needed help, and if they didn't show up, somebody go out there and look after them, because God knows what's wrong with them. All of that has been torn out. 
And what I found remarkable over the last few months, both on the committee and in this stall, is that between three different ministers, none of them would take responsibility for that. And to my knowledge, they're still not taking responsibility for them. All getting paid a nice fat wage and will retire on nice fat pensions, but not taking responsibility for the demise of one of the crucial services uh, that, that look after rural Ireland. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of the infrastructure is the broadband, because We've privatised the provision of broadband and we're still making the bags of it and we are now saying uh, take it away, you guys compete with each other, see who can give us the best price and then uh, we'll see where it goes from there. What about, in what, what was the year in 19... In the 1950s, we were able to turn on the lights in the Black Valley and in every little isolated community in Ireland. We didn't say, well, uh, how long will it take to tender that out or what company will be able to um, deliver it quicker, faster and easier. We set up a state company called the Electricity Supply Board and that did the business. It brought the power to Black Valley, to Glen Column Kill or whatever you're having yourself. We are going to make a bags of it by putting it in private hands, just like we're making a bags of the question of provision of social housing. So as long as we prioritise the right of profit over the right of communities, over the right of individuals, over the right of our population to decent services, as long as we do that, we will face the continued decline and isolation and utter destruction of our rural communities. And as a dub, I find that obnoxious. And I will stand up for those communities at any stage if they fight back with the post office workers, the bus workers, or any of those fisher, fishing communities that will stand up and fight this state for adopting a neoliberal approach to their lives rather than one that actually fulfills their needs. Thank you very much, Deputy Smith. Deputy Dr. Michael.